Okay, time for another GIS practicum. And yes, I'm still coming from my garage due to COVID-19 isolation procedures. Um, so we had a little bit of a hiatus while uh, all of the directives came down, but uh, we're picking back up essentially where we left off last time. So just a little refresher. We are in grass. I am using version 7.6, uh, 6.1, I think. Uh, actually, check that. I am on my laptop now, so I had to use a different version because 7.6 wasn't working on my laptop. I am using 7.8.3. I do not have the exact set of maps that I was working with last time. That was on my office computer. And so I did my best before starting the video to sort of semi-recreate what I think I had done in the last set of videos. So we should be basically more or less where we left off last time. And today it's just going to be a sort of uh, fairly focused practicum on the map calculator. And before I start on that, I just want to say that you may see if you're not using 7.8.3, if you're using 7.61, you may see a slight different uh, label of where the map calculator is. And I can't recall right now without looking at 7.6 exactly what the difference is. But at least in 7.8, they have made a sort of simplified version of this tool that I'm going to show you. And they've called it rmapcalc.simple. And I'm going to stay away from that <clears throat> because even though they call it simple, I think it just obscures too much. Uh, and the map calculator as you will see, is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful tools, <clears throat> well, in any GIS, but I think particularly in GRASS, has really good map algebra. So, before I do any actual operations, <coughs> excuse me, that is not COVID, that's just a, a regular cough. <laughs> um, I'm just going to show you briefly what I mean when I'm talking about map algebra. And here particularly, I'm just going to go to the help page, the manual page for r.mapcalc, or the map, calc, map calculator tool in GRASS. And what you'll see in here is, you know, I'm, I suggest you do it yourself. You just put r.mapcalc into Google search and you'll find it real quick. Uh, it says operators, and you'll see all of these minus, pluses, nots, ands, greater thans, less thans, ors. Uh, and all of that kind of stuff. And if you scroll down even further, you'll see um, another table of functions, including things like absolute value, uh, the cosine, the arctangent, the uh, graph function, and then if statements, uh, and is null statements, max, mode, and min, all of these things. And if you can read through some of the brief descriptions, what you're seeing is basically everything you learned in algebra, geometry and trigonometry essentially you can do in grass with the map calculator but instead of putting in like a single number for your variable x or y you actually can put in a, a map and it will calculate the function that you write the, the equation that you write at every single cell of that map and if you put in more than one map uh, and the maps align with each other, as they typically do. These raster maps, you know, are cellular. They have a grid, and the grids are sort of fixed in space, and they stack right on top of each other. Basically, what we'll do is we'll take the little numbers out of every single cell in your raster map and find whatever number is in the cell, the corresponding cell of the other raster map, and let's say you're just adding them together. In that cell, it will add those two numbers together, and the new map in that cell will be the product, the, the sum of those two original numbers. And it will do that in every single cell location across the entire uh, landscape. So um, just by way of starting, what I will do is show you the actual map calc tool itself. It's in the raster menu. It deals with just raster maps. And... In older versions, it was just lying there. It would say R map calc right here in the in the menu item. But in 783, it says raster map calculator. And then you have the simplified one and the real one. And I'm going to show you just the real one because I think it's simple enough. So this is what it looks like. It sort of looks like a, a calculator. And then it has a few 
menu things to insert maps. So these are just some basic, the basic functions that I showed you from the help file right here. So you can look up exactly what they, what they are and what they do. And um, then this is to insert a map from your map sets. Um, this inserts one of those functions that I was talking about, like cosine or arctangent or something like that. And this is simply the name of the map that you're going to make. And then down here in this text box is where you actually type in your, uh, your command. And so what I'm going to do is uh, just do a real quick uh, example. And let's just start with slope map. And we'll take a look at the slope map first before I even do anything over here. So we'll just turn this, this is walking time in the background, and we'll turn on slope right here. And I'm going to just make it a little bit uh, transparent so that it, you can see some of the shaded relief map, which is on the bottom down there. Okay, so if we do this and we add ourselves a raster legend for slope, and we put it on the map over here, let me give it a background of white. Okay, so now we can actually read it. So you can see because this is topographic slope, the maximum slope technically is 90, but on this particular map, wherever the steepest part is, is 72 degrees. And of course the flattest part is perfectly flat, zero, right? So the map contains values between zero and 72. And, uh, you know, if we want to look at the spread of this map, we can come up here and create a histogram. And uh, there it is. So we can see most of our map is below 10 degree slope. And then, you know, smaller proportions of it are actually steep land over here. So I'm going to leave that up kind of over here in the corner. We're going to leave all this alone. And we are going to go back to our map calculator. So what I did is I added the map by going to insert existing map and then I clicked slope and it put it down over here. And I can use these tools or I can type it in on my computer, but let's just say divide by two. So I have the slope map divided by two. And here I'm just gonna write half of slope. And we'll just hit run and you'll see well, I don't know why it's saying that, but it's saying that to me. <laughs> that doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, and we go back over here, and it's added half of slope. And now, by default, it gives it this weird color scheme. So I'm just going to right-click on it and go to where it says Set Color Table. And then on the Define tab, I'm going to pick the... Down at the bottom, there should be... Uh, where is it? Slope colors there. I'm going to hit run. And so there. It's now uh, colored that map like a normal slope uh, map color. But you can see there's a lot less pinks in there because we divided everything by two. And so if I open up my D legend, I just double clicked on the legend to get this up. And then I scroll to the top where it says input. And so it still has the first slope map. We'll go down and we'll get the uh, half of slope. And we can see now the maximum slope is 36, which is half of 32, right? So that's what it did. It basically took every value on this map and divided it in half, right? Uh, so that's kind of an interesting, uh, but kind of, I don't know why you'd want to do that, divide every value by two, but maybe you do. It just shows you just how quickly you can do uh, how many, probably a couple million cells in this particular map. You, you can do a couple of million calculations in like a second or two. Uh, so it's very efficient and, and quite powerful. Okay, so that was all well and good. What can we do uh, that's a little bit more meaningful? So last time I showed you about querying uh, vector maps at the location of uh, vector points. And this is my Neolithic lithic scatters reconstructed to the best of my ability from home here on my laptop. Uh, and so in here, remember I have these 
uh, columns, and I've, I've done a few more. So I have slope aspect, the walking time from streams, and then I actually did flow accumulation from before when we were calculating stream flow in our watershed. And so those are the values of those raster maps at the location of each of these particular sites that I had extracted, just Neolithic sites that were lithic scatters. And you can see them all here. These little red dots are them. And so those values are the actual input data. And if you remember from Tuesday, we were talking about predictive modeling, and that's what we're going to do in Project 3. So I'm going to show you a few of the steps for how to do uh, uh, some of the procedures we talked about, which is to use an inductive uh, logic, modeling logic, to come up with some values based on the set of known Neolithic lithic scatters to create a predictive model in the end where we will uh, essentially go back to the landscape using the values at, you know, of particular landscape characteristics at the known sites and we'll code in all the other parts of the landscape that fall within those similar kind of conditions, right? So here we have slope aspect, distance to stream, walking distance to stream, and flow accumulation. And eventually we will have um, the visual scape to add into the model as well. Uh, but I'll just show you briefly how to do a real quick, fairly quick and dirty um, sort of coding of these original maps, the slope aspect, streams walking, and flow accumulation into uh, areas that um, are associated, you know, with these Neolithic lithic scatters and areas that are not. So we're just going to take that m those maps and then turn them into a binary map where one means the values are within the range of uh, the values that the known sites have and zero means it outside, sorry, outside the range of those values. So uh, I showed you last time that we could use the tool um, v univer for calculating statistics across, you know, down through the column. And uh, what we'll do is I'll just do that again. And, and uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. we'll go down to the, let's just start with the slope column. And we'll just hit run. And I'm going to stick this guy over here kind of big, right? So the average slope is seven and a half degrees and the maximum is 20 degrees and the minimum is one degree. So this gives me quite a, 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 a range that I could choose from, right? So if I believed that the maximum cutoff should be somewhere around 20, I could use 20 degrees as a cutoff. On the other hand, you see the mean is 7.5 and the standard deviation is 5.3. So what I could do is to say one standard deviation away from that mean should be my cutoff. And since I have a spread that goes down below the mean as well as above the mean, I can basically add one standard deviation and that will get me uh, essentially 65% of all the variability that is within my sample data set. That's the statistical reality. If I was to do a standard deviation on either side of the mean, there's a curve like so, and I would get 65% of the variation. Now, you don't have to think about that necessarily. I mean, obviously, if you're going to do this for real, you're going to want to make sure you understand things like confidence intervals, and, and you could even look at an actual histogram of the values. Um, but for us here, a quick and dirty thing would be if I wanted to capture all the variability, I would just use something close to the maximum. If I wanted to hedge my bet a little bit, and knowing in this case the minimum value is pretty close to the absolute minimum value of zero slope, I could just add one standard deviation to my mean. In this case, I'll just say my mean is about seven and a half. And, um, my dev sample deviation is about 5. So I could basically make another cutoff at 12.5. And if I wanted to be real, n if I wanted to narrow it down, if I, if I believed that 
uh, Neolithic sites were not on flat flat ground, then I could go one standard deviation below and I could have a minimum cutoff too. So I could subtract 5 from 7.5 and I could get 2.5, in which case I would make a map between 2.5 and 12.5. And I'll show you how to do both or all three of those things, right? So here I am uh, back in, whoops, where's my map calculator? Oh, I guess I closed it. Uh, let's go back into our map calculator. Uh, raster, map calculator, there. Okay. And what we're going to need to do is to create an if statement. So this is a function. You could click into the function. Whoops. You could click into the function and you could uh, scroll down to where you see uh, we're going to need an if x a b. So it's just going to set up a blank template for you right there. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to do if, and then we're going to have a logical statement where we test to see if whatever we're, do, what we're saying is true. Then we'll have the value we want. Otherwise, the value if we don't want it, right? So let's now insert our slope map here. So if slope, so it's important to have that if and then open parentheses, slope is less than or equal to 20. So we're using the maximum value. And then the comma is there. And then we're going to say 1. That's a positive because all our sites are there. Otherwise, 0. And here we'll have slope max bin. So we're making a binary map of just 1 or 0. And the slope max means we're just using the maximum value. That's just for us to remember what it was. And so now we can hit run. And there we go. Uh, if we look at this over here and I get up my little query tool, anything in purple is a value of zero, anything in yellow is one. So basically everything yellow is 20 degrees or lower. So that might be fine. We might be happy with our, with our just max cutoff. Um, Alternatively, if we didn't want to go all the way to 20, we could have gone to that 12.5, which is mean plus one standard deviation. And I'm going to click the allow override button so we can just do that. And what we'll see is it changes, right? So it's still going to be uh, one in yellow and zero in purple. But you can see because now we use 12.5 as the cutoff we're going to have a lot more purple cells. Now, the last thing I mentioned was doing plus and minus one standard deviation around the mean. And in this particular case, that might actually be the most reasonable thing to do, considering that the minimum, absolute minimum, isn't zero. It's actually uh, one degree or so. So again, if we do this, and our data is perfectly normally distributed, a perfect, perfect bell curve, Theoretically, that would give us 65% of the variability, one standard deviation on either side of the mean. To do this, we need to do a bit of a nested uh, if statement. So here, what we can say is if slope is less than or equal to 12.5, and then we can use our double ampersands up here, and uh, we'll have to enter slope again is, well, actually it shouldn't be an and, it should be an or, so it should be these double bars, that's an or, or slope is uh, greater than equal to 2.5. So if the slope is less than or equal to 12.5, or slope is greater than Yeah, I was right the first time. It should have been an and. See, this is a little tricky. Uh, double ampersands in there. Okay, so now what we're going to have is uh, slope. I'm just going to call it interior because we're having two cutoffs, a low cutoff and a high cutoff. There we go. So it's basically turned all the very small, like low flat slopes into... Um, into purple 
and all the very high slopes into purple. So these are the Im this is one potential input that we could use for building a predictive model. So let's go back to our uh, V univer and let's calculate the stats for aspect now. And aspect, remember, it's it's basically the direction, cardinals directions, basically in degrees, you know, north, south, east, west, whatever it is, that the direction of the slope is facing. So this is an interesting thing to use in a predictive model because maybe people put their sights on south facing slopes to take advantage of morning sun or winter sun, or maybe they put them on north facing slopes if it was hot and dry in the summer and they wanted to be in the shade earlier in the day. So if we look over here, the mean is 148 degrees. And if I'm recalling, uh, grass starts essentially um, due east and then goes counterclockwise around from east. Uh, so this would be facing kind of like southwest or, or southwest by west or something like that. That's the mean, right? The range is all over the place. Maximum is 337, and the minimum is 13. So what that tells me is, uh, yeah, they're pretty much all facing sort of semi-southish, which is kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting, uh, you know, pattern here. And it might be a little hard. Probably looking at a histogram in this case would have been better. Uh, but you can see. There's the mean, which is about 149. We could round it to 150. And the standard deviation is about 100. So we could do the same thing where we have an interior and an exterior, or a minimum and a maximum. So we could go like 50 to 250. And that should put them all kind of facing south. So let's just take a look at what that might look like when we. Uh, when we do it over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just blank this out. I'm going to blank this out over here. I'm going to call this aspect interior bin. And just need to be deleted there. And I'm going to get my uh, this mouse. I'm using this tiny, tiny little mouse. It's super annoying. OK, so now there's our if statement blank again. And now we're going to add in our aspect is greater than or equal to 50. And then we're going to put in our double ampersand. And we'll get our aspect map again. And that is uh, less than or equal to 150 and then we'll put uh, 1 and 0 and of course I wrote bon up here alrighty so I think I zoomed in inadvertently so there we go uh, everything I guess I meant not facing south, I meant facing north because I said counterclockwise from east. So yeah, so everything is facing this direction. This may be real, this may be spurious. Uh, in fact, I know Wadi Hassa survey mostly focused on the southern bank of Wadi Hassa, so it's not uh, much of a coincidence, I think, that everything's facing north. So you may choose, once you do this kind of analysis, that, that eventually you're not going to use this in your analysis but it's useful to go through it anyway and see how it works so let's keep chugging along let's do this for the next uh, uh, column which uh, would be our time to streams walking time from streams so if we hit run over here we have the mean is 1500 or so seconds and the standard deviation is uh, pretty darn big. It's like uh, 1,122 seconds. So some of these sites are real close to streams, and some of them are real far away. 
And if we look at the min and the max, that's pretty interesting. So in this particular case, what I'm going to do is sort of just use my logic here, and I'm going to round everything. I'm going to go, let's say, so if I was to subtract 1,100 from 1,500, 1,500 is the mean. That would give me a minimum of about 400. And if I was to add it, that would give me a maximum of uh, 2,600. So again, that's well below the actual maximum site, but let's say we're doing our 65% confidence interval, and that's, that's fine with me. So let's go on back over here, and we're going to do the same thing over here, except we're going to do... Um, Streams walk interior, and I'm going to type this out from scratch because you can just type it in there with your little fingers. Uh, if our streams walking time is less than or equal to uh, 2600, and so I'm going to put my double ampersand. Uh, the same map streams walking time is greater than or equal to uh, what did I say 400 and then I'm gonna put my comma 1 comma 0 and then close my parentheses it's important to have that last parentheses it'll give you errors otherwise and we can hit run and there we go so now we have a nice sort of interior buffer not right up against the streams but not far away from the streams and very quickly let's do our last one that I have loaded up here which is our flow accumulation so we'll hit run and here we have a mean of about 13 and standard deviation of about 24 and Minimum is 1, and maximum is almost 100. So I'm just going to round that up to 100, and I'm going to do a simple cutoff at 100 or below. So in this case, I'm going to type it in again. If, and then I'm going to go here and find my flow accumulation is less than or equal to 100, 1, 0. And then I'm going to call this uh, uh, flow ACC Oops. max bin run and there we have that so basically quite a lot of the landscape which is fine so what we're going to do now is to take a look at these uh, maps that we just made. These are binary maps, so they have ones and zeros, and they're actually integer binary. Um, what we're going to want to do is to turn these into some sort of probability map, and we want to combine them. And the simplest way is to just do it as an average of, let's say, these four maps. So our flak max bin our streams interior walking cost bin, our aspect interior bin, and why not? Let's go with our um, let's go with our original slope max bin right there. So what we'll do is we'll go back into our map calculator. We can delete everything out of here, and we'll just do predictive model. And I'm just gonna this one because you're going to want to play with this a bit and change the weighting and formulas but I'm going to just type this in pretty straightforward for now uh, so what we'll do is we'll go to insert existing map we will pick our um, slope max bin and we'll just add a plus sign and we'll put then our uh, aspect interior bin and then another plus sign and then we'll put our um, streams walk interior, another plus sign, and we will put our last one, 
which was um, flow ACC max bit. So what we want to do is go way back to the beginning, put an open parentheses, go here to the end of the line, put a close parentheses, and then we're going to divide it by one, two, three, four maps, four. But what we really want to do is to put a point zero because otherwise it will still want to make it an integer. So it'll, it'll only be one or zero. And we want to now, if we put the point sign, they'll say, okay, everything should become floating point value. So it'll give us some variation between zero and one, which is more interesting for what we want to do. And there we go. So this is the amalgamation. And if I zoom in on part of this map, let's just uh, zoom in somewhere over here. And if I go back to uh, my layers and I take my sites and I put them up on top, let's, um, let's scroll somewhere where the area, there we are, where we have our sites like so. OK. So now what we can see is in the background, we have our predictive model. And if we query it, the value of z uh, the, the values that are coded yellow are 1. These values are 0.75. These values are 0.5. Those are 0.25. And somewhere in there is going to be a 0 value, a real dark value. And if I go back here and I make my legend be for uh, where is it? my predictive model map what we can see is that's the way it is this is from between 0 and 1 um the areas that are 1 meaning means that all four of our topographic variables are predicted uh, based on the cutoffs that we did uh, as high probability possibly containing or having a Neolithic site on them, a part of the landscape given our inputs that suggests a high probability for there being the site of the kind that we're interested in. doesn't mean there is one there, just according to our formula, that's a high probability. And those that are colored in the blues that have a low number have a low probability given again our formula. And you can mess around with that. Uh, any number of ways. You can obviously add different or an additional uh, set of, uh, of parameters and for each new parameter you're going to want to add a number over here. So remember this is the average value. So if you have four input maps you divide by four. If you have five input maps you divide by five, etc, etc. Unless you want to weight one. And I might say I really think that streams is uh, more important by a factor of two than the other uh, factors. So I can add an interior set of parentheses just around streams, but before that plus sign, whoops, parentheses. And inside that parentheses, I can multiply it by two. So I'm giving it a strength of two. And because that map is now counted twice in there, I got to change my four to a five, because now technically there are five maps. We're counting streams walk twice in there. And I'm going to call that predictive model 2. And I'm going to hit run. And what we'll see is the colors in the map sort of changed. And, you know, it's going to be the same color ramp as before. But if we go back and forth between predictive model 1 and predictive model 2, we'll start to see that uh, there is a values that's query inside here that now we have like 0.6 and 0.4 and getting close to 1 around some of these things and 0.8 so now we actually have more possible values between 0 and 1 because now we had five maps and we're seeing that we've weighted highly those areas close to the streams and so a lot of the high numbers are close to the streams and let's take this one step further um, we can weight it really highly. We can say it's three times more important than the other maps. And now we're going to divide by six. And I'm going to call this three. I'm going to hit run. And there we go. We start to see 
we start to see as we scale up. So here's our original one where everything was weighted equally. Here's uh, the walking costs to streams weighted twice as heavily. And here we are always weighted three times as heavily. And we query around in here and we can see we have values of like six, 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 and uh, eight, three, 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 three. And what we can see is uh, essentially we've triple weighted those areas close to streams. And so that might be something reasonable or, or could be not reasonable. Uh, it's sort of up to you, but if I zoom back out to the entirety of the map, you can start to see as I again sort of go back down through all of our maps, the impact of weighting that. And I should say that you don't have to just weight one of them. Let's say you thought streams walking was three times, um, but the slope was two times. So again, I'm going to put some parentheses internally around slope, and I'm going to add my uh, multiplication by two. And again, I got to turn this to seven because I'm adding another map. And I can hit, uh, I'll turn this into predictive model four, and I'll hit run. And there we go. So um, what you can see is you can play around with that. You can change your cutoffs. You can add or remove factors. You can weight factors in there. And this is, again, a real simple, quick and dirty way of doing predictive modeling. And ideally, we'd want to take our time a little bit more and look at histograms of the data and think a little bit and you know come up with more reasonable cutoffs and again this is the inductive approach where we're starting with data from known sites and going from there we could do the deductive approach where we simply start with um, some ideas sites should be within 100 uh, meters of streams and sites should be on land that is less than 10 degrees slope and sites should be on blah 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 so you could just come up with cutoffs that come from your uh, theoretical understanding of human behavior, let's say in this case related to farming or pastoralism or hunting and gathering, why people would choose to put their sites in one place and not another. So you can come up with your cutoffs any different way, but you would combine them in, in pretty much the same way. And again, I did this as a binary from the very beginning, but you could always start it as a, um, you know, non-binaries between zero and one probabilities from the beginning and of course then you'd get a lot more variation in your final maps over here as well. So I think that's going to do it for uh, for today's practicum just about the map calc. Um, it's a pretty powerful tool you can do a lot in there multiplying maps together doing this boolean logic um, and, and all of that it's actually really just the sort of tip of the iceberg and I encourage you to play around with it to read through the help and to get a sense of how it all works. Um, I will say that this is like my one of my number one tools for doing modeling in GIS. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty good at this point of, at writing complex map algebra statements in CRAS's map calc syntax I find it to be pretty flexible and pretty powerful. And once you sort of master this, it's kind of the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do in raster GIS uh, from a modeling perspective. All right, guys, I will see you all virtually next week.